Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, Facebook Live. I am here with Pamela Blake, uh, board certified neurologist and uh, moderately world famous author of uh, quite a number of papers on uh, headache medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. I think we are going to have a lot of people out there who are interested in uh, seeing uh, this broadcast and hearing all about what you have to say, whether we, we do this live or not. I wanted to start by, you know, just kind of talking about your background first, your training. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I grew up in Pennsylvania, and so my undergraduate degree is from the uh, University of Scranton in biology, and I then attended Georgetown University Medical School. <laughs> my neurology residency was at Georgetown, and then I did a neuro-ophthalmology fellowship at Johns Hopkins. And after fellowship, I returned to Georgetown and was on faculty there from 1995 until 2006, at which time I moved to Houston. And um, I uh, spent some time also at the NIH uh, in the cognitive neuroscience section of the NIH doing, uh, participating in research on um, um, not headache related, but other conditions having to do with behavioral neurology. Cool. And so how did you get into headache medicine? It was sort of a number of events that happened. It was not my original intention to do headache medicine. Mm -hmm. It was originally neuro-ophthalmology, but I also was very interested in behavioral neurology. Okay. And so <clears throat> when I returned to Georgetown, um, there happened to be several neuro-ophthalmologists in Washington, D.C., which is not a very large city, and mm -hmm. a city can only sustain so many neuro-ophthalmologists, so yeah. you end up seeing other other mm -hmm. conditions as well, and headache being common in neurology. I was seeing a lot of people with headaches, some of whom were being referred because of their visual disturbances. Um, also, I think because of my interest in behavioral neurology, some of the behavioral issues that are present in people with headaches were not um, off-putting to me, and I found it interesting. So I sort of did more and more headache medicine, and then the person who was primarily doing headache at Georgetown retired, and so I took on more of her patients, and um, eventually, by I think about 2001, I was seeing enough patients with headache that we established a formal clinic at Georgetown, the Georgetown Headache Clinic. Mm -hmm. And so I continued um, doing more and more <clears throat> headache, and particularly becoming very interested in the occipital uh, presentation, the nerve compression presentation in people with headaches after working with Yvonne Duchik mm -hmm. in 2004. And so when I moved to Houston in 2006, it was offered to me by the hospital where I interviewed to have a practice that would be solely devoted to headache. And by that, mm -hmm. by the time I left Georgetown, I think headache was about 70% of my practice anyway. So it was an easy and very nice move to do that. So I've been doing solely headache medicine since 2006. Mm -hmm. And so you're now a member, aside from being obviously a board certified sort of neurologist, member of the American Headache mm -hmm. Society, International Headache Society. Mm -hmm. uh, you did some part of your training and background was at the NIH, and so you do some interesting forensic neurology work for them, which we were talking about uh, earlier, kind of dovetailing with your behavior, right. your interest in behavioral neuroscience. Yes. The forensic work is not just directly for the NIH, it's, it's usually for federal public defenders and oh. some other organizations right. around the country. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to touch upon was your most recent paper, mm -hmm. which I posted about uh, not too long ago oh, on uh, unremitting head mm -hmm. and neck pain. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about the paper and the, sort of the uh, a summary of, of your findings and your thoughts. Well, the paper was a wonderful um, <clears throat> and very very pleasant experience to write that paper and sort of pull everything together into one place. And the theory that um, is outlined in the paper um, draws on what we've learned about the anatomy of innervation of the outside of the head and how that connects with intracranial nerves and how it can explain why a patient can have or a person can have headaches that look a lot like migraine type headaches, mm -hmm. yet can reduce significantly or sometimes even go away with a decompression of nerves on the outside of the head. And um, so we, in the paper, we spell out the, the anatomic connections. We mm -hmm. spell out the role of other factors that are important in nerve compression, um, particularly with the occipital nerve compression patients, which seem to comprise a, a larger percentage of my practice, mm -hmm. cervical muscles, yeah. and the involvement of, of physical activity that can aggravate their pain, and um, 
uh, why surgery should help, uh, drawing on the work of anatomists, mm -hmm. plastic surgeons, and particularly the sort of some kind of revelations I just had over the last few years that I think we're, I think one of the problems we have is we're too focused on the, on the head and we don't pay enough attention to the neck. And um, we in headache medicine don't ask often enough about head pain and where the pain is located. And we view the, the neck pain as sort of a separate process or something that goes along with the headache. And I think, in fact, we need to view it all as one, one phenomenon. It's all one condition. Got it. And um, so, um, tell us a little bit about the kind of general, because I, I, I'm much more simplistic, I think, than you are in terms of certainly my understanding from a neurological perspective of headaches. I understand anatomy pretty well. I understand surgical principles. My my gross sort of understanding of the the overall view of headaches is that they tend to be primarily intracranial processes, some chemical abnormality in the brain and so forth. And, and again, obviously correct me if any of this is, is uh, incorrect or probably well overgeneralized. But uh, I think that's one of the things that was a big eye opener for me as I started to do a lot of peripheral nerve work with Lee Dellen, also at Johns Hopkins, um, and then ultimately going out into practice. And now peripheral nerve surgery comprises 85, 90% of all the things that I do. Um, but it was amazing to me that, you know, you have a lot of similar presentations in the head and neck with similar symptoms, but in the arm, for example, and after trauma or uh, prior surgery, uh, most people would clearly classify those symptoms as an aroma or an injured nerve, but in the head and neck, it was uh, basically labeled, for example, migraine, uh, which again was uh, thought to be an intracranial process. Uh, and I think that's where the way we look at it is fundamentally different. What I appreciated so much about your paper, which is you know, kind of really melding those or bridging those two uh, philosophies. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Well, I think I, in the paper, I talk about the spectrum of, of headaches mm -hmm. ranging from intracranial to extracranial, and that there's an anatomic uh, connection as well, a uh, spectrum anatomically. Episodic headaches, I think we can view, at least I view episodic headaches as being primarily centrally brain mediated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so at one end of that spectrum would be, for instance, the patient or the person who has very infrequent migraine with aura and the visual disturbances and maybe even language disturbance is the primary um, manifestation of their migraine and then they have some pain as well um, that patient is very different from from the patient who has a constant pain on the back of the head or in the neck area right here mm -hmm. that just never stops or goes away right. um, and so there are two completely different presentations most people are somewhere in the middle of that spectrum though and they, they have of some features of both of those kinds of pains. Um, we know that, and, and this, this is an area where, where clearly so much work needs to be done. We know something about the changes in the brains of people with episodic migraines. We know a fair amount about what happens during a migraine aura. And so migraine with aura is a pretty well-studied phenomenon. Migraine without aura is not as well studied. We just don't have as much data. We have very little information about what happens with pathophysiology is of tension type headaches, okay. even though they're more common than migraine type headaches. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, I, I, again, I mean, the, the world of headache medicine is, I, I think, going to have a lot of, um, a lot of exciting work ahead to study these extracranial factors. I, I think that the, the role of the periphery though is, is becoming uh, clearly acknowledged in particularly people with unremitting pain. Mm -hmm. um, again, recognizing that that pain may be in the neck, it's not always in the head. Mm -hmm. And um, understanding those anatomic connections are, are really gonna be where the focus will lie. And how, so you touched upon this, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit, that within the neurology community, uh, you are a co-author on this paper with Rami Bursty, Bursty, sorry, um, at the Beth Israel Deaconess, and also a board-certified neurologist. Amongst your colleagues, are people mm -hmm. open to this idea, um, either academically or in private practice, or uh, is is there a lot of resistance? Do you think? I mean, it's just an opinion. Now. Well, my my observation is that people are becoming more and more open to uh to the concept and i think when when headache medicine doctors 
see a patient or, or when they hopefully read the read the articles and and you know understand the full concept of the um, of the anatomy that that will help and when they when they i hope have the opportunity to see a patient who has done well with the surgery that that will that will help as well just this week i saw a patient who was referred from a neurologist in atlanta and a patient who was referred from a neurologist in chicago Great. so yeah so i think people are, are learning about it i i was invited to speak last year at the southern headache society meeting and i spoke also last year at the European Headache Federation meeting, and yeah. um, my understanding is that some surgeons in Europe are beginning to perform the procedure. Good. Yeah. Um, and so you work with a surgeon, Carlton Perry, right? Yes. And actually you recently opened sort of a, a practice with him, yes. which I think is phenomenal. Tell us a little bit about the makeup of that practice. It's you, it's him. Yes, I'm very excited other, about this. Yes, people. because the practice will comprise myself at representing headache medicine. <clears throat> and Carlton representing the plastic surgery piece. Mm -hmm. We also have a, an occupational therapist who provides the post-operative um, occupational therapy directed at the neck for range of motion and just sort of gentle exercises for the neck, as well as a psychologist. And the psychologist is a very important piece because as with many other pain conditions, emotional factors play sure. a large role. And right. so we are interested to know with each individual patient, not, not solely for the head surgery patients, by the way, but for all people with headaches, we're thinking about those emotional factors and possible stress triggers. Okay. And so, so take us through, let's say a patient presents to your office uh, mm -hmm. from a neurologist in Atlanta, says I'm referring patient over a difficult headache case, uh, unremitting neck pain for many years, mm -hmm. uh, has been through a multitude of medications from various classes, various kind of traditional modalities, acupuncture, massage, and so forth. What, what's your approach to that kind of person? I assume they would probably see you first. Right. In my, in my office, my practice has always been that every new patient, um, I see the, that patient for the first visit. And so we, we devote about an hour to going through the history and the physical. And the history is really mm -hmm. focused on, tell me about your pain. Let's talk about your pain. Where, how often do you feel it? How long does it last? Where in your head and neck is the pain located? Mm -hmm. uh, what does it feel like? What are the associated symptoms that you have? What's the intensity? What makes it better? What makes it worse? What other pain conditions do you have? So there's lots of questions to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, a, a general um, history as well with regard to other medical conditions. And then the physical examination, which I'm sure you are well, well practiced at, uh, palpating the nerves of the skull mm -hmm. and seeing if there are patterns of tenderness that will uh, reproduce their pain or, mm -hmm. or cause a headache that's similar to what they experience, as well as a full neurological examination, looking at the fundus to make sure that there's not any disc edema that could in indicate increased intracranial pressure and a, a full neuro exam. Um, <clears throat> and then it's usually, you know, the, the history, as is with as is the case with most of medicine, the history is the is where the answer lies, and so right. usually you can get a pretty good indication of whether there is a nerve whether a nerve compression headache is present. No, I, agree. I don't find nerve blocks um, to usually be um, very helpful. Sometimes they are, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're not, and I, I I I'm not usually. It's uncommon for nerve blocks to be the uh, the most important factor in determining whether headaches are due to nerve compression. Yeah. Sometimes though, they're, they're, they do provide a very useful um, diagnostic effect, but usually it's more helpful therapeutically for the patient. <laughs> if I think that somebody is a good candidate for surgery, then the next step is, uh, well, two steps. The first step will be a referral to the surgeon. Um, and yes, I work most closely with Carlton Perry. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Carlton will evaluate the patient and. Um, talk with them about the uh, about the surgery, and also a visit to the psychologist to undergo a routine psychological evaluation. And uh, we're interested in looking for a number of, uh, of factors, and mm -hmm. uh, we work with the psychologist. Um, Lynn Davis is the person we work with mostly, and Lynn uh, has, a, has a very good comprehensive assessment, and it's very helpful, and she'll help us determine if the patient would be benefited by doing some cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very standardized treatment, about 10 sessions, working with a therapist, identifying factors that may play a role in, in their perception of pain, maybe even their experience of pain. I mean, there's a growing literature about stress and its role in inflammation. Mm -hmm. sure. And um, just one of the patients I saw this week, her terrible headache started during a very um, busy and stressful time of life. And the stress all settled down, but the headaches never went away. And um, so this is, some, uh, this is an area that we're... Uh, 
uh, working in now with um, uh, uh, Greg Dessner up at uh, UT Dallas, who, okay. who does a lot of work um, in extracranial factors with headache as well. And so we're looking at some inflammatory tissues and trying to see if we can devise a study that will help us to determine if there are stress factors related to the development of that inflammatory tissue. Right. Um, if uh, and then if everything you know looks um, looks good, we'll go ahead and make the recommendation that we move forward to surgery. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about that cognitive behavior of therapy because I think your approach there is mm -hmm. uh, really is brilliant. And uh, it, so that begins before. I mean, they see the cognitive or the psychologist before surgery? Not or? always. Sometimes it's necessary. And it really depends on, uh, on the individual patient. And I think it's important to recognize that stress factors may, and when I use the term stress, I'm speaking very broadly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's less common for stress factors that are important in headache to be external and more common for them to be internal. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For instance, um, people who... Um, are worriers or people who have uh, very high expectations like of themselves, perfectionists, especially of the self-critical type, no. um, that can be a source of stress. Chronic headaches are, are, in fact, one of the most common physical symptoms with that type of condition. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, people who have had trauma histories and uh, sat very sadly have a much higher rate of headaches as well as a number of other medical conditions. Um, and so what, what the cognitive behavioral therapy is aimed at is helping people to learn how to reframe their, their thinking so that um, they will view situations differently, maybe view themselves differently. And it's very important to do that because our goal is helping the patient to get better. And we want to, we want to employ every possible means that we have. And as we talk with our patients um, about it, their post-op visits, there are two factors that can cause a flare of headaches in somebody who otherwise has been doing well. Number one, for the people with occipital pain, it's any kind of excessive or strenuous engagement of the neck and shoulder muscles. And number two is stress. And so simply helping a person to raise awareness of the role of stress, what is stressful in their life? Where does that stress come from? How can they modify it, um, it is very important. And so for some people, it is best to start that conversation prior to the surgery. Less, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And then, and then, of course, simply living with pain for years becomes very stressful. Right. Sometimes people uh, can have um, even a little bit of an adjustment. You know, they can do well with the surgery and their headaches get better, and it, it can be difficult to adjust to that new life. Right. Yeah, that, the that mask is almost like a void that Yes. Is left by this thing that was so central. Exactly. So exactly. And I've seen that in a number of patients, and I've found mm -hmm. that very interesting. And this number one that I referred to by a psychologist locally, who I think mm -hmm. has been very helpful and actually first pointed that kind of thing mm -hmm. out to me. And um, I think it was raised by that one patient who was on a, that show I was on, but you know, mm -hmm. he, his headaches were gone, and now he had to figure out what he's going to do with his life because before he was. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it can be destabilizing. And, and also sometimes when, when, when people are so focused on simply getting through the day because of their headache, other factors, other life sort of situations can accumulate and then they need to be addressed okay. when the pain is better. So, yeah. so let's, uh, another thing I found interesting that has been mentioned in a number of things that you've written and presented, because I've seen a number of those presentations and with which I agree completely, is the role of opiates, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the treatment of headaches from a pharmacologic standpoint, meaning the use of medicines, but also uh, the role that they play uh, if a patient is a candidate for surgery and how you utilize them postoperatively. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think you're, you have very specific uh, guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, if, if that's the right word, to, to manage those kind of people. Mm -hmm. It is not uncommon when people have nerve compression headaches to need pain medication. Mm -hmm. um, they simply cannot be controlled with taking triptans every day. Sometimes triptans work, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. And in order to remain functional, people sometimes need pain medications. And um, sometimes they'll be taking a lot of Excedrin or ibuprofen, and they'll end up with uh, with the GI symptoms conditions that would yeah. result from that, and sure. that's certainly not ideal. Um, so it is not uncommon for someone to need uh, a low dose of an opiate pain medication, meaning about 30 to maybe 50 morphine milligram equivalents, MME. Yeah. Um, that is not uncommon in my experience, and almost always after surgery, 
as pain reduces, the use of that medication declines and people come off the medications. That is what happens for 90% of patients. When we um, use those medications, we prescribe in, uh, in very close adherence to the CDC guidelines from 2016, okay. which do recommend uh, keeping the dose, um, if possible, to below 50 uh, MMEs, mm -hmm. um, making sure that no other medications are being used that can um, increase the risk of an overdose. And so that means mm -hmm. avoiding benzodiazepines mm -hmm. and presumably also, although not specifically mentioned, a lot of other medications that can be very sedating. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we monitor the prescription monitoring program, and uh, there are a lot of ways to look for other um, conditions that would be would be sort of red flags or concern us they're actually pretty uncommon i mean mo and and most of the time when people are using these medications it's in order to maintain employment and to keep working or keep being a parent and keep living their lives and it's just generally not a problem if there are some concerns if a dosage is very high or if somebody mm -hmm. has been on a medication for a very long time uh, then we involve a another specialist in that area to help with the process of making sure that we that those medications can be tapered post-operatively. And so sometimes that will involve uh, an, in a planned inpatient stay after surgery okay. to taper off of the medications. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, uh, evaluation by a psychiatrist to see if there is an addiction issue uh, present is helpful as well. Great. Um, so, as sort of to finish up, we've got a little bit of time left, but um, you again touched on this a little bit earlier <clears throat> in terms of your work with uh, that one other physician whose name I already forgot, but uh, with regard to looking at the inflammatory mm -hmm. uh, mediators in the soft tissues that could perhaps be impacting some of the perception of pain or the, the actual uh, biologic makeup of the pain or cause. Uh, what do you see as the uh, things? You know, if you had to predict what we'd be doing five, ten years from now, um, based on the things that you've seen in your work with Carlton and, and these other people, how how do you see headache medicine changing? Well, I think the most important factor will be to identify these patients quickly, so that we're not treating patients fifteen or twenty years into their history of having daily or almost daily pain. Mm -hmm. And I think the process of a patient having to try um, three or four or five different preventive medications and then try some Botox and then try some CGRP medications and then try some blocks and then try this before they end up at surgery, um, I, I, I think that that is not the ideal way to go. Mm -hmm. in, in my uh, opinion, if it is very clear that nerve compression is present based on the history, and maybe we'll have some some good imaging that might be available mm -hmm. because right now we really don't have anything right. that's yeah. um, very useful. Um, if it becomes clear that that's what's present and the pain is bad enough that it is um, debilit not necessarily debilitating, but limiting the level of function, sure. most people would say, well, let's just fix this and make it go away. Right. You know, I mean, if somebody has carpal tunnel and their hand is getting weaker and they're having pain, you're not going to say, well, let's try four different medicines right. before we do. No, you're just going to move to the surgery. Yeah. And that's that's been my impression too. And that's actually pretty well established dogma in the performer surgical world. The chronic compression untreated leads to more neuronal damage, meaning that the nerve cells themselves. Yeah. And so eventually you lose sensation permanently or you lose function mm -hmm. permanently that can't be recovered. Yes. And we do see that clinically. The longer the headaches have been going on, the less likelihood that somebody will have a really good response right. to nerve decompression. And I found the longer it takes to achieve that ultimate mm -hmm. response, in other words, mm -hmm. people have had nerve compression headaches for five years or less. And again, it's just a gross number off the top mm -hmm. of my head. Within a few weeks or months, notice significant mm -hmm. benefits, whereas those people that come to see me with symptoms 20, 30 years in the making, mm -hmm take a much longer time to realize those benefits. I agree, I've seen that as well. Plus, there is the emotional consequence of living, living with pain for so sure. many years. Yeah. Plus, there's a likelihood that more treatments have been done that may be damaging to the nerves. So for instance, um, ablative uh, procedures, radio mm -hmm. frequency ablations, yeah. uh, which can uh, be right. injurious to the nerve can occur, and then you can have dysesthesia, the patient can have dysesthesia, and in addition right. to their initial underlying nerve compression sure. headache, and yeah, yeah. Um, 
So one last point that I would make is that one of the things that I first saw when I started doing these types of operations, trying to interact with my neurology colleagues, was this idea that uh, you could uh, either go the surgical route or the medical route, but you know they, they weren't necessarily complementary. Um, as many people who've read whatever I've written online and posted, I post a lot about my nerve work, but a lot about my wife and a lot about her story with breast cancer. And I think for me, it was a real eye-opening analogy because uh, right now, I think the standard of care for breast cancer, if you have a new diagnosis or you're at high risk with a BRCA mutation, you go to a cancer center of excellence and all those cases get run through a tumor board. Mm -hmm. And that tumor board is a, a multidisciplinary group of physicians, radiologists, uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, breast surgeons who will remove the tumor, plastic surgeons who will do the reconstruction. Uh, and you put all those things together, dietitians to optimize the diet, physical therapists to help with any lymphedema symptoms and or prevention. And that's where you have numbers like stage one breast cancer five-year survival is quote nearly 100 percent according to the american college of surgeons and those uh numbers were not those numbers when i was an intern back in 1997. um my big sort of soapbox thing was saying well i think we need something similar in headache medicine i'm actually really jealous i've asked if you have a twin sister who's also a neurologist somewhere maybe she wants to move to san francisco because i'd love to do what you and carlton are doing i think it's really important so congratulations on that any thoughts on that? Because um, I think so many of my patients still require some medication uh, for modulation of headaches. I don't pretend to cure, and I never promise my patients you'll never have a migraine again. I think certainly the amount and dosages, frequency of these medications goes way down, but we still need help. And again, I sort of like the breast cancer story, I think you know, put a good neurologist, a good psychologist, plastic or peripheral nerve surgeon, whatever their background and training surgically might be, um, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, and, and those people are going to do well. I agree. And I think that's a very important point. I'm glad you raised that. And I think it sort of goes back to the spectrum issue, depending on where mm -hmm. somebody is on the spectrum. Surgery may be all that's needed for that patient to become essentially headache free. Most people are not at that very end of the spectrum. And so many people will continue to need, um, well, I'd say maybe about 50 to 60% of people continue to need some medication after mm -hmm. surgery. It may be in the form of a muscle relaxant. Right. It may not be a, and of course, if there is episodic migraine, somebody can be in two different places on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so if, if a woman has menstrual migraine in addition to a nerve compression headache, menstrual migraine is probably not going to go away and right. so she'll probably continue to need some triptans for that yeah. um, some patients continue to need botox after the surgery some people have a sort of form frust a sort of milder form of cervical dystonia and they continue to have significant uh, tenderness and spasm in the trapezius muscles mm -hmm. sometimes they may need botox or just a muscle relaxant um, they need uh, coaching about being careful how they work on their computer and on the laptop and sometimes with employment issues. Uh, but yes, that's right. So after surgery, we don't, we, we desire to get people off of all medications, but we don't expect that everybody will come off all medicines. But even if they're not able to come off all medicines, people will generally say that when they do have headaches, they're much less severe. They're much easier to abort with a triptan mm -hmm. medication yeah. and quality of life is usually much better. And we can measure that in some standardized uh, scales that we use in the office. And we see those numbers come down quite a bit. Right. Well, uh, I think we could talk for hours or days about mm -hmm. this. I'm super very passionate about it. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. and. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. I may be able to forward them to you and uh, see, you know, see if you can answer them. And hopefully, uh, you know, wish you a lot of success. I have no doubt that you're going to do extremely well in uh, your work with Carlton. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Well, thank you very much. Right. I appreciate yeah. it. All right. Take Thanks care. For the opportunity. Bye, everybody. Thanks Good for joining night. us.